Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Wojciech Przybylski um, from Visegrad Insights, Respublika Foundation, based in Warsaw. Uh, we're very happy to have you all today. Uh, we'll begin uh, in one minute, just in one minute, waiting for everyone else to connect on this very timely uh, uh, and important topic with uh, fantastic speaker, guest speaker, and our host, uh, uh, who will moderate the session. We're very glad that you um, took the time this afternoon or morning, um, as this is Visegrad Insight Transatlantic Breakfast, and we, we have some guests from across the transatlantic. Uh, it's important uh, that uh, all of you stay, uh, keep your mics muted. Um, so as we will, we will be having a discussion, uh, Philip, the moderator, the, the, will um, ask you to unmute the mic before you speak if you, if you will have questions. Uh, but do keep your mic mute at all times. Otherwise, to enable a uh, nice sound for, for everyone else uh, during the discussion. Um, uh, I see just a couple of more people. Uh, well, they're still joining. Some people are still joining. Um, uh, I'll first again welcome. Uh, Let's this. Okay. <laughs> Danke. Okay. Thank you. Uh, can I ask everyone now to be sure their mics are muted or are, are on mute? I don't. I cannot see some people. Some people are uh, still have this this mic on. Let's just make sure that the mics are off. Um, and I wanted to say, yes, that uh, Visegrad Inside is a Central European uh, network uh, magazine, transnational uh, platform for debate and analysis. So it's really a merge between uh, a think tank and a magazine organizing sessions with diplomats, experts, community and journalists, uh, sometimes now, now under pandemic, even uh, more than once a week on, on Zoom, on video chats. Uh, we call these sessions Visegra Inside Breakfast. They usually take place uh, in our office uh, with a morning coffee and a croissant uh, um, with the Warsaw community. However, we are very fortunate that under pandemic, uh, like many other intellectual uh, work is it has moved online and is attracting more and more interest this uh, this session is is one of those with uh, with a lot of interest it's a very timely subject that we're going to discuss today uh, and our moderator uh, is Philip Fritz a correspondent of the Welt um, I'll uh, hand it over now to Philip I'll just mention one other technical detail this session is on the record for the first part for about uh, half an hour or so when there will be introductory statement and it's discussion um, uh, between the, the moderator and our special guest. And then for the Q&A for the, for the informal part, we will turn off the recording and we'll keep it con more confidential. And we ask you to not to quote anyone unless someone specifically agrees to. So Philip, over to you. Thank you. Um, welcome, everybody. I am uh, happy to see that many participants and distinguished experts of international relations and uh, security policy. I am uh, especially delighted to welcome uh, Carlo Mazala, who is a full professor for international politics at the uh, Bundeswehr University in Munich and lecturer at the University of Munich. Um, Mr. Masala is a member, too, of the German Council on Foreign Relations till 2017, and please correct me if I'm wrong. He was the council's chairman. Um, in Germany, Mr. Mazala is famous too, uh, amongst other things, for his podcast, uh, Sicherheitshalber. Some of you <laughs> might know him. Together with other three experts, he, uh, in this manner, explains security policy issues to a broader audience. Um, I am again delighted to welcome Veronika Laputska, who is uh, going to be our first, uh, first not correspondent, but respondent. Um, Mr. Putska is a co-founder of the uh, East Center and a research fellow at the German Marshall Fund. Um, as Wojtek already said, uh, my name is Philip Fritz. I am a foreign correspondent with um, Welt and Welt am Sonntag based in, in Warsaw and I'm reporting from 
Poland, the Baltic countries, and uh, Ukraine. So uh, thank you, Visegrad Insight, for inviting us all, uh, especially Wojtek Szybilski, of course. So uh, our topic, as you all know, is um, the German perspective on Central Eastern European security issues, uh, and of course, the future of Europe. For the first 30 minutes, um, Mr. Mazala and I will talk, and then afterwards, uh, I'm going to open the floor to everybody. You can send uh, questions to me via the chat function, and uh, I will try to include uh, as many of you as possible. So, uh, a topic that is uh, widely discussed in Germany, and this is already my uh, first question to, to Mr. Mozala, uh, and abroad is uh, our German economic uh, interests. Uh, what is often underreported uh, German security interests. Uh, but of course, Germany has a certain security interest, uh, especially in Central Eastern Europe. So to introduce us all a little to our topic, uh, Mr. Mazala, what are those security interests regarding Central Eastern Europe, uh, maybe especially Poland? Uh, and what do German security interests mean for the countries of the region? Mr. Mazala. Yes, um, thank you very much. Good afternoon to everyone. And um, <clears throat> also, uh, thank you to the to Visegrad Insight, um, Wojciech, uh, for inviting me uh, to this talk. And thank you, Philip, um, because you contacted me um, and invited me to, to do this sem seminar with you today. Um, I would say as a first thesis that actually German security interests in Central and Eastern Europe uh, hasn't changed much since 1990. And the catch word is strategic depth. So um, going back a bit historically, without boring you out, um, the, the former German defense minister Volker Rühe in 1994 in Travemünde at an informal um, ministerial of NATO of the defense ministers was the first to air the idea of bringing Poland, the Czech Republic and Hungary into NATO. At that time, this idea was completely rejected by everyone else in NATO, uh, and especially by the US, because they had no interest. And if you ask yourself, why was Germany so keen in, and, and so early in bringing those countries uh, into NATO, I think the answer is strategic depth. If, if you have a bit of a military background, I think everyone has to agree that defending your own territory 600 kilometers eastward is a much better situation than defending your own territory at the border with another neighboring country. So bringing Poland in would mean, into NATO, would basically mean extending the line of defense of Germany's territory to the Polish-Belarus border at that time. And this is still the major interest of Germany in security terms. Secondly, of course, I would say, uh, and Philip, you mentioned it, and I'm not a political economist, so therefore I say just it's economic prosperity. I mean, Germany wants these countries uh, to be economic prosper because Germany then with its export-oriented industry can trade with those countries. And of course, it's political stability. So we, if, let's put it in very realist terms. If we consider Central and Eastern Europe as a bit of our backyard, we want our backyard to be stable and not destabilized in security terms, in economic terms, and in political terms. So roughly, this is Germany's security interest. The problem, however, is that over the, let's say, past 10 years, a development happened which the German political elite didn't expect because the German political elite was very much mesmerized by the idea that now that, centr that now that the Soviet Union has collapsed, Central and Eastern European countries have become democratic. I exaggerate, eternal peace will break out. So the idea that Russia might turn into either a neo-fascist, neo-imperialist, neo-communist country was a kind of residual category, which was in the back of the minds, but in the very, very back of the minds of Germany's defense planners and people in the foreign office. But no one really thought that this would happen. This was a long-term, a, a 
potential long-term problem, but we were very much focused that Russia would become stable, kind of democratic, and would cooperate with the rest. And there, our security interests basically fit together. Yeah, to say stable backyard, stable democratic Russia, so we will have, of course, political problems, but that's all. And then 10 years ago, some would say even longer ago, some would say shorter, doesn't matter. We discovered that Russia basically, yeah, gets on a kind of neo-imperial route. And since Germany has an interest in having stable relations with Russia, but also stable relations with Central and Eastern European countries, these two interests clash because the Central and Eastern European countries in their majority felt threatened by the development in Russia and asked, of course, Germany as one of the most important countries in Europe to sideline with their threat perception, while the Germans were extremely reluctant because of their special interest with Russia. And in a nutshell, I mean, I exaggerate, but in a nutshell, this is the basic problem of Germany in Central and Eastern Europe. It is the existence of an aggressive Russia. So, but at the same time, it is the interest of having still some form of cooperation with Russia, but not to the expense of the Central and Eastern European countries. But second thesis, when push comes to shove, Germany is inclined to have better relations with Russia at the expense of its security interests of the Central and European uh, neighboring countries. Mm -hmm. So maybe very, I mean, broad sketched Germany's security interests and why it is so problematic nowadays to reconcile it, the security interests we have in Central and Eastern Europe with the security interests we have vis-a-vis -vis Russia. Mm -hmm. So to rephrase that uh, negatively, from a German <laughs> perspective, uh, Central Eastern Europe is a buffer zone. Did I get that right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, can you dig a little deeper into the colliding German and Russian interests in Central Eastern Europe? Uh, because we all know what happened in 2014 in Ukraine, what is happening today, the Russian aggression against Ukraine, war in Eastern Ukraine, the uh, illegal annexation of Crimea, and so on and so forth. Can you explain why that Russian aggression is a threat to other Central Eastern European countries, especially Poland? Well, I mean, if I'm not an expert on Polish foreign and security policy. So I, I come from, from a realist background. I'm a trained realist in, in, in a, um, international relations theory term, uh, term. But when I put myself into an office in Warsaw, I look at the Russia, which is extremely aggressive vis-a-vis -vis my neighboring countries and is destabilizing my neighboring countries and is trying to get my neighboring countries into his hegemonic orbit, which basically means that the threat is getting closer to my, in that sense, eastern border, which of course is destabilizing for a country like Poland. I mean, Poland has more or less, I would say, the same interest than the Germans do have with the difference that basically uh, between Germany and Russia, there is Poland. And Poland basically has these kind of countries as neighboring countries, which Russia tries partly successfully to destabilize, to create chaos at the eastern, let's say, at, the, at Poland's eastern flank, which, of course, for a country like Poland is an unacceptable. Mm -hmm. So what we don't understand as Germans and that's one of the major problems. Um, I mean, intellectually, we do understand the Polish reaction. Yeah. But actually, we don't want to be, I exaggerate, dragged into the harder stance Poland takes vis-a-vis -vis Russia because of our special interests with Russia. And therefore, we have frictions. I, I remember, I mean, it's, I think it's still existing. There used to be a time, this was mid of the 90s or something like that, when the idea was that basically um, the traditional German-Franco relationship would be broadened up into a triangle, the so-called Weimar Triangle. So, and then basically Poland as a kind of leader of the Central and Eastern European countries would basically join this kind of special relationship 
And among the three, a lot of policies would be discussed, developed, and so on and so forth. To my knowledge, the Weimar Triangle exists, but it's more or less like the dying uncle next door, where you know he's lying in his bed next door, he's dying, but no one dares to talk about it. Yeah. So we left this idea of having this kind of special tri triangular relationship, which would extend also to, let's say, the democratic Central and Eastern European countries. So, and now we are faced, and I'm not talking about domestic changes in, in Poland, about the new government and so on and so forth. This creates also from the German perspective a problem, but um, let's stay with, with the security aspect. I worked for NATO for five years, so I experienced a bit the debates uh, within NATO between Poland and Germany. Yeah? And whenever it came to the nature of the Russian threat, the German took a much softer stance on that than the Poles. And I think to understand this, you just need to look at the map that Poland is much closer to Russia than Germany is. Yeah? So at the end of the day, the, the, the more aggressive Russia will become, the more Poland will suffer, less Germany, because still between you know, Germany and Russia, there is Poland. So the Poles basically gets all the hits coming from the uh, destabilizing movements of Russia in, 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 in the Baltics, in Ukraine, and so on and so forth. The potential, let's say, the potential unification between Belarus and, uh, Belarus and, and Russia. I mean, th that's why Poland is so active in Belarus, because they want to make sure that Belarus didn't get too much dragged into the Russian orbit and stays a kind of independent country. Um, while we are very much focused on Russia only and ignore to a certain extent the problems between Russia and Poland, I mean, geographically speaking, not the bilateral problems, they have also bilateral problems, but we ignore basically the problems emanating from the geostrategic uh, location between Russia and, and Poland. Mm -hmm. um, we were talking so far German and Russian interests colliding in uh, CEE countries. Uh, which sounds a little typical for two Germans talk in Central Eastern Europe, right? We haven't included so far the interests of, uh, of other countries. So yeah. my next question would be, uh, are German security interests maybe clashing with the interests of other countries in the lead region, let's say Polish or Ukrainian or Hungarian interests? Well, let's say, I, I would say that the basic clash is the, um, the question of, the, th and the basic clash emanates from a different threat perception. Yeah, look, um, Chancellor Merkel, I think three days ago, four days ago, she gave this kind of um, speech at the Adenauer Foundation, where basically she laid out German priorities in foreign and security policy. And if you read the speech, I found it quite interesting that, I mean, three things. First of all, she didn't get tough on China. Yeah, she said, I mean, China is a factor. No one can deny China the rise and getting back its place in world politics as, I mean, they look at, at history. Um, surprising that she didn't get tougher on China. Secondly, of course, she said, you know, Russia, Ukraine violation, Russia domestically, you know, authoritarian country, which doesn't uh, respect human rights and so on and so forth. But then for the first time since a long time, she emphasized much more the fact that Germany needs Russia and needs cooperative relationships with Russia. And the third big chapter was the US, where of course she made clear that the US is the most most important uh, security relationship that Germany has um, currently and even in the future. But if you read the speech, this was much more, yeah, let's say the usual phrase you give in a speech rather than very substantive um, and very convincing that the Germans still do believe that only in close German-US relations, you know, there is a future for Germany and its security and for Europe and its security. Mm -hmm. So I don't know whether I push the envelope too far, interpreting this speech as a slight change in the fundamental parameters of Germany's security policy for the 21st century. Yeah? But I found it quite surprising, mm -hmm. I must say. Mm -hmm. so. so you would say that Germany has a different perspective on relations with Russia and with China, 
yes. than the United States at the moment, and most likely to most Central Eastern European countries, right? Yes. I mean, as far as I know, the discussion and the debate in Central and Eastern Europe, of course, I mean, every country would prefer to have a cooperative Russia. But in the light of Russian moves recently, I mean, let's say since, I would even say since 2008, remember the debates we had in 2008, where the Poles would basically say, look at Georgia, that's Russia. That's what the Russians want. That's what they're going to do. Be careful, you know, pay attention. And we were still like, okay, I mean, this was a fait accompli, you know, it's Georgia. So it's not that much important, strategically speaking. And only in 2014, we basically partly bought into the Polish threat perception of Russia, into the threat perception the Baltic states had on Russia since a long time ago. So now that we see that despite all the sanctions, despite the efforts undertaken in the Minsk group, that Russia is not really moving into a more cooperative direction, there is potentially another shift. And my concern would be that at the end of the day, of course, we will never accept legally the annexation of Crimea. We will never accept what the Russians are doing in Eastern Ukraine. But my take is, we will, I mean, we're looking at Crimea as a kind of fait accompli. Yeah. And we will accept a Russian security interest in Eastern Ukraine when the Russians will give up the act of fighting. Yeah. So at the end of the day, I think the desire for stability reason, especially now that you don't know, you know, in which direction uh, the US will go in the future, regardless who, who's going to win on November the 3rd. Um, we're laying the ground for more cooperative uh, relations with Russia because we realized when I say we, it's the German government, it's not me, it's the German government. <laughs> um, the German government potentially probably realized that despite all the measures undertaken to drive Russia out of Eastern Ukraine and probably or even uh, out of Crimea, we will not succeed because the idea that if we put impose economic sanctions um, at, a at, at a certain moment, the Russian will give up the annexation and their de uh, destabilizing policies or aggressive policies in Eastern Ukraine because it's too expensive, apparently didn't work out. Apparently, mm -hmm. Russia is ready to pay an extremely, in economic terms, even in political terms, to ex pay an extremely high price in order to have Crimea and to be in Eastern Ukraine. So if this is true, we're going to change policy vis-a-vis -vis Russia. We will not lift the sanctions, I don't think so, in the foreseeable future, but we're going to extend more cooperative relations with Russia um, in the next years to come. Mm -hmm. uh, recent policy debates or security policy debates in Germany, a pretext for that kind of shift, I mean, let me, let me fast forward or let me jump to recent security policy debates in Germany that spark, let's say, irritation uh, at best in Central Eastern European countries. What I mean is the debate around the concept of nuclear sharing yeah. and uh, the idea of some members of the uh, SPD party leadership to get out of the program or end cooperation with yeah. the uh, US in this field. So this debate is closely related to the debate about a replacement for uh, the German tornado, um, Germany's old fighter jets. So can you explain those two topics and why they're important from uh, CEE? perspective. Yes. Um, to give you some background, um, the German Bundeswehr has to replace uh, its tornadoes because I, they're becoming too old. The US is modernizing its technical nuclear weapons, also those stationed in Europe. So the, so the, the famous B-61. Um, it's the, the 12th cycle. So they haven't been modernized so far, but there is a program and they will be modernized in, in the foreseeable future. If they are modernized, and these are the weapons basically, uh, actually, the, these are the weapons for um, nuclear sharing in NATO. If they are modernized, the tornado won't be able to carry those weapons in case of a conflict into the designated target. So therefore, the German Bundeswehr has to decide um, to replace the tornadoes. The German Minister of Defense, Annegret Kramp-Karrenbauer, has made 
not a decision in terms that, that she basically signed the contract, but a conceptual decision to say, okay, the number of planes we need to be, still be in the nuclear sharing policy will be replaced with the F-18, so an American fighter plane. And the rest will be replaced with Eurofighters. And then in 2040, we will get the FCAS, probably the fifth generation fighter jet, and we're going to replace everything with the fifth generation fighter jet. The Social Democrats don't like the idea. They don't like the idea that Germany is going to buy tornadoes, uh, going to buy F-18s. Why? Because the Social Democrats don't like the idea that we buy American because there is Trump in the White House. So. This was very much made clear by the uh, leader of the German Parliament, of the Social Democratic Parliamentary Group, uh, Rolf Mützenich, who is an international relations specialist, no doubt about it. Um, and he doesn't like the idea. So he came up two weeks ago, three weeks ago, in an article in a German newspaper with the idea that Germany, and now th there the problem starts, should unilaterally renounce its role in nuclear sharing. One has to know that in the coalition treaty between the Christian Democrats and the Social Democrats, as well as in the previous coalition treaty between the Christian Democrats and the Liberals, yeah? so this goes back to 2009, I think, there is always the peril that the government will make an effort within the framework of greater disarmament initiatives to basically get rid of the 20 to 30 nuclear weapons stationed in Germany. So the idea was always, yes, because nuclear weapons are not very much popular in Germany. I think they're not very much popular in, uh, everywhere, but in Germany, they're extremely unpopular. Um, so every government basically said, yeah, I mean, we will make an effort to get rid of these weapons, but within the initiative of a bigger nuclear disarmament initiative, because NATO has roughly, or the US within the nuclear sharing program, has roughly 130 to 150 tactical nuclear weapons all over Europe station. The Russians have 1,800. So it makes sense to say, you know, we're ready to give it up, but within the context of a disarmament initiative, where also the Russians have to reduce the number of their tactical nuclear warheads drastically. So this is the military point. So he came up with the idea of unilaterally renouncing um, the nuclear weapons in, in Germany. And this is surprising. This is really surprising because he's an IR guy. I mean, he's a smart guy. Yeah? It's, it's not the kind of, of politician who doesn't know the subject and has to say something about international relations and the experts are thinking, well, this doesn't make sense. He's an expert. And he wanted to renounce it unilaterally. Um, and he was heavily criticized, even by his own party. I mean, the foreign minister of Germany, Heiko Maas, not very influential in the Social Democratic Party, but nevertheless foreign minister, said nuclear sharing is part of Germany's security. Yeah? What people are wondering is, are two things. First of all, if you look at the time frame, this, initi I mean, this initiative is totally out of time because it doesn't make sense to make it right now. Why? We don't have elections only next year upcoming. If the Social Democrats want to portray them as the party of peace, as the anti-American or anti-Trump party, they could have made this stunt next year. Secondly, of course, if we give up nuclear weapons, which are on our soil, we don't need the F-18. Full stop, because we need an American plane which can be certified within four or five years to carry these kind of weapons. But, but if we give them up, we don't need the plates. Also, interestingly, the decision to buy these planes will be taken only after the next elections. So to make the point now is totally useless. You can make this point next year because next year, or in two years, the parliament is going to decide whether to allocate the money to buy the F-18. So even from that perspective, it doesn't make sense. And of course, the most important thing was, and this was for me surprising, since the Social Democrats 
are the party of international solidarity. They didn't even have a proposal how to satisfy those countries who think that nuclear sharing is still important. I mean, basically, they were ready. Uh, this proposal could be read that the social democrats or parts of the social democrats are ready to let nuclear sharing totally collapse within NATO at the expense of deterrence. Yeah? So all these three aspects, and this is what puzzles me until today, they simply do not make any sense. So my point was always, if I were a security advisor to Rolf Mützenich, who made the proposal, I would say, okay, we want to get rid of these kind of nuclear weapons. But then we have to offer something to those countries who feel threatened by Russia's nuclear weapons. I mean, these are the Poles, these are the Baltics, Romania, Bulgaria. So whoever is close to the Russian border, yeah, give them something in exchange to show that you take their security perception seriously. And this is exactly what didn't happen. So I can understand the reaction in Poland to say, surprise, surprise, they care a damn about our security perceptions. So isn't something the Germans could give the uh, Central Eastern Europeans in exchange simply atomic bombs? I mean, what about Poland or the Baltic countries and nuclear sharing? Poland, for example, is going to buy the American F-35. I mean, let's be, let's be realistic. If Germany would yeah. uh, renounce these kind of weapons, the Polish government will take them. And I think every Polish government will basically take them. But there, are, there are certain problems connected with that. So the, Russia, the NATO Russia Founding Act would then be basically buried, definitely. I know that if I talk to Polish officials, they, they all tell me, well, it's already buried long time ago. So what's the point? But officially, Germany is still very fond of this kind of uh, NATO Russia Founding Act which makes very clear no permanent stationing of combat troops in Eastern European countries, no nuclear weapons in Eastern European countries. So, but this is one thing. I think that Poland, maybe others, would be uh, very much uh, ready to get these kind, or to, to get their role in nuclear sharing. Let, let's basically say this. There is a political role in nuclear sharing because every NATO member is part in the nuclear planning group. But there is a military role in nuclear sharing. And these are the five countries who have tactical nuclear weapons on their soil. And in case of a conflict, put them under a national plane and bring them into an allocated target. Yeah? Mm -hmm. My point would be the political role is fine. But if you have the technical role, you have a greater influence on NATO's nuclear strategy. Because at the end of the day, you have to agree with your role in conflict. Yeah? And the potential enemy, let's be frankly, right now, the Russian Federation, they of course will basically try their utmost to prevent the countries which have the technical role to carry the nuclear bombs into the designated target. So you are at much greater risk, but your influence is even bigger. So therefore the US pays attention, much more attention within NATO, within NATO, not with its own national nuclear strategy, if you uh, have a technical role in nuclear sharing rather than only a political role, meaning having a seat at, in the nuclear planning group. No? That's one thing. The second thing is, if you want to give up your role in nuclear sharing, which I can, given, let's say, the uh, public opinion in Germany, which I can fully understand, yeah? that you say public opinion is against it, maybe I can score some points in the next elections, by speaking up against you know, these kind of nuclear weapons in, in Germany. Then think about it, what you could do conventionally to show to your allies that you are still someone they can trust. And now we're talking about the Baltic states, for instance. The Baltic states have NATO air policing. What they desperately need is tactical air defense. They can't afford it because it's damn too expensive. If I were an advisor to the SPD, I would say, okay, we make the move and we say, listen, guys, we don't want to have these nuclear bombs on our soil for whatever reasons. But we take security perceptions of others very seriously and thereby we propose that Germany will basically buy and train Baltic armies 
in tactical air defense. So, which basically for them is really an added value in their security architecture. So for us, it would cost a bomb, but we will show that we are not basically an unreliable ally in NATO, that we still take things seriously and we are ready to do more than on the conventional side rather than on the nuclear side. And then you can start negotiations within NATO, whether the Poles or the Romanians or whoever, you know, want, uh, wants to have a technical role in nuclear sharing replacing Germany. But let's also be clear. Um, it's not only about, you know, bringing this couple of 20 to 30 nuclear weapons to a location in Poland. You know, it's about training. It's about doctrine. It's about facilities. So I think even if Poland by tomorrow would say we're ready, it will take five to eight years before Poland can perform the role properly. Because, you know, the idea is just, you know, bring by truck or train or plane 20 nuclear bombs somewhere to Poland and then everything is fine because the Poles can do it is an illusion. So it takes some time until then the Polish Air Force um, is properly trained and equipped, you know, with the F-35 and uh, with uh, common maneuvers uh, with the U.S. and so on and so forth to perform this role in a potential conflict properly. So we will have a gap of five to eight years in which basically nuclear sharing won't function that well and won't have the proper deterring effect on the Russian Federation. And therefore, it's even more important to say, so how can we deter Russia then during this interim period? conventionally. And their tactical air defense for the Baltic states is one thing I would propose. Mm -hmm. I got one follow-up question about nuclear sharing, then I would like to open the floor for everybody to uh, ask questions. So my follow-up is, uh, but isn't the concept of nuclear sharing not a little old-fashioned or outdated? It is a concept from the Cold War. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't know any other examples in the world of nuclear sharing, I mean, except Europe. No, I mean, the nuclear sharing is part of what I would call extended deterrence. And there are two models of extended deterrence. The one is the European model and the other one is the Asian model. The Asian model is without American nuclear weapons in Asia. The European model is with nuclear weapons in Asia. Why is that still important? Maybe it's no longer important for pure hardcore military reasons. Yeah. But, and that's what I call always the beauty of deterrence. It, look, it might look to every one of us, especially if we take a map out, okay? And we have this huge 800 pound gorilla Russia, even territorially speaking. And we have these tiny little Baltic states, yeah? So, how realistic is it that we're gonna risk a nuclear escalation with Russia if they invade the, Pol uh, the Baltic states. Objectively, everyone would say it's totally unrealistic because the Russians conventionally are quicker in and out of the Baltic states than NATO can even react, yeah, due to geography. So the point is that we have a strategy which says flexible response, we reserve the right to escalate even in nuclear terms if such thing happens. And if you look at the map, you think it, it's never gonna happen. But if you sit in Moscow, you still have doubts whether maybe NATO isn't crazy enough to use nuclear weapons to really defend the Baltic states. Even if there is just 1% chance that this will happen, but this 1% deters you from the action because you don't want to be the guy who orders the attack on the Baltic states and wake up next morning and basically have mushroom clouds on Russian territory. Yeah, so the deterring effect is important. The second thing which is important, according to me, is <clears throat> by having American nuclear weapons, which you put on a German, Dutch, you know, Belgium, Italian plane, you have the connection between the strategic U.S. deterrence and the tactical European deterrence, which means the U.S. is going to be involved in such a conflict. Yeah? Because otherwise, let's assume 
there won't be any nuclear weapons, US nuclear weapons in Europe. And then, of course, you still have the security guarantee of the US, meaning in case of conflict, we might use uh, intercontinental missiles with nuclear warheads. Then you have the same problem, the old, let's say, Adenauer de Gaulle prob problem, when uh, de Gaulle went to see Adenauer in 61, before we had this kind of sophisticated system of nuclear sharing and so on and so forth, and asked Adenauer, do you really believe that the Americans are risking the destruction of New York for the liberation of Hamburg? Yeah? So, by having American nuclear weapons here, the question is not solved because there's still this uncertainty, but it makes it more realistic that the Americans are going to be engaged in a conventional escalation here in Europe, rather than if the US is with its arsenal only in the US or submarines or, you know, bomber planes flying somewhere around. So there is a very important role it plays in the deterrence mechanism. While I might agree that probably, you know, if you really talk hardcore military, you know, I mean, where do you going to basically drop the bombs at the end of the day. It might not play this kind of a big role it used to play 40 years ago. But still, this is what most people forget, according to me. It, is, it has still a deterring effect on Russia because every Russia, I mean, Russia, when it wants to escalate, has always to keep in mind that NATO might escalate too with nuclear weapons. And this is something you don't want to have. Yeah, this changed your planning completely. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mazala. That was very, uh, very insightful. Um, I would now call on Veronica. Are you, are you back, Veronica, as a first responder to ask yes, a question? Yes, I'm back. Apologies, I was having some technical troubles, but I've heard, I think, uh, almost everything from the fascinating speech of Professor Mazala. So I'm happy to follow up on that. Okay, the floor is yours. Wonderful. So first of all, thank you very much, uh, Richard Brett and Sai. Thank you, Wojciech. Thank you, Quincy, for inviting me. And it's great to meet you, Philip and Carlo and, uh, and Professor Masala. And it's great to see so many uh, wonderful participants from various countries and uh, various embassies. So, so we are really quite excited to have you all here. Uh, the first thing I'd like to say is that I very much agree with what Professor Masala has said. Um, I think that um, the picture we're having now in the region is quite uh, disturbing. It's quite a worry for us. And for me, as a representative of Central Eastern Europe um, person, um, I, I feel this uh, kind of getting worse and worse for us. And to follow up on that, I'd like to cover a few more things, uh, which I think will be important for us to continue with our discussion. Well, first of all, it's uh, when we were doing this scenarios for Eastern Partnership 2030, we kind of were looking um, with the Wishgrad and Sandin German Marshall Fund. We were looking at two more, more or main hegemons. It's uh, even three, actually. It's the European Union, and of course, a lot here depends on Germany, Russia, and the US. So, for this region, which is kind of uh, squeezed between big powers, NATO, to to speak broadly about this in Russia. Whatever is happening in these three centers of power, it's, uh, it's always worth uh, watching and it's always, uh, always leads to certain um, geopolitical consequences, but also political um, um, changes inside these countries. And what do we see now? We see, um, and this hasn't been mentioned, um, quite a disturbing picture happening in Russia with a lot of victims in terms of COVID-19. But also we see um, kind of in the back of it, which is quite uh, not on the surface for many external uh, observers, um, the, the way how Putin is pushing constitutional reforms at the moment in order to become um, a president which can be elected for a limited number of terms. The thing we have already in Belarus or in some other uh, authoritarian countries in Central Asia, for instance. Uh, so this is one thing. Uh, secondly, we see um, really disturbing protests happening in the US and we see already how Trump is now actually arguing with his uh, defense ministers and with the kind of really senior staff 
if we speak about um, uh, military um, goals and military strategies and tactics, people who actually determine this. Uh, so this is another kind of worry for the region. And now we have this uh, issue of nuclear sharing in Germany. And um, oh, when we speak about Germany, it really has uh, an, an incredibly important role for both uh, as a center for the European Union and also one of the leading powers of NATO in the region. And it's seen the same way in both Central and Eastern Europe, but also by Russia. For Russia, Germany is um, a country which they kind of, um, they respect. You can tell that by the fact how many times Putin uh, meets with Angela Merkel and how he actually kind of, there is this aura of uh, respect for this power, for the leader, and also for what they're doing. Um, they might not be uh, treating um, in a serious way countries of Central Eastern Europe or Baltic states, but Germany is a country which they will always uh, observe and they will always uh, monitor what is happening inside and outside. So this kind of um, recent news about nuclear sharing um, decision and uh, this uh, fluctuations we see now between Germany and US and US is now busy with uh, two problems of uh, protests against uh, Russia discrimination but also COVID. Of course this gives I think Russia a certain signal that uh, this might be some kind of window of opportunity for them to start pushing their politics in the region. Um, so I believe that um, this is probably something uh, a lot of German, not only just people in general, but politicians uh, do not really re maybe realize. Uh, I know that in Germany there are a lot of also among uh, uh, high circles of politicians, people who actually respect Russia and who think that actually NATO uh, should be guilty themselves for doing what they do and that actually Russia is afraid of NATO, but it's not true. It's a kind of, this is what Russia propaganda says. But in fact, of course, um, uh, Russia has a very different, uh, if you look at the history of Russia, also type of uh, diplomatic behavior. It might be a little bit irrational for uh, Western parties, but for them it's not. It's whatever it takes for them to, to um, consolidate the power. And it has been different during the times of when this country existed, especially in the 1990s, but now when Putin is uh, trying to consolidate his power more and more, and when for him his image and the image of Russia is, is extremely important. Uh, also in the light of the upcoming uh, constitutional reforms, but now they also have this health system crisis. Uh, there is a big chance that um, he might try or um, actually act in the geopolitical capacity also to distract um, Russian population from the problems they will be having in the aftermath of COVID-19 pandemic when they will have an economic crisis. They, it's already kind of boiling up there. Um, so I, I think that uh, these factors, but also um, the recent factor of uh, the perception of China in Germany, because I think we all have seen this uh, opinion polls, that China is now perceived quite well um, as opposed to the European Union in Germany. So I think Germany actually plays a, a crucial role at the moment in kind of in this geopolitical crossroads. And I think that for the Central European Union countries, to uh, lose such an ally or like uh, in terms of its capacity within NATO uh, would be really uh, frustrating and uh, would, could lead to unexpected uh, results actually. And um, this is all from my side and I think we can continue the discussion. Thank you so much once again.